I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is TC Daily, the technology show brought to you by Tech Central. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so at youtube.com slash techcentral. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our daily newsletter? You can do that at techcentral.co.za slash newsletter, and you'll get the latest local and international news. And these shows delivered to your inbox at 5 a.m. every weekday morning. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome two top executives from Samsung into the studio to chat about the world of consumer electronics. Justin Hume is Vice President for Mobile, and Mike Van Leer is Consumer Electronics Director, both at Samsung South Africa. Gentlemen, welcome, and thanks for joining me. Thank Thank you, Duncan. Hi. Thanks for having us, Duncan. Lots to talk about. This is the week, we are recording this in the week of Black Friday, which uh, I know is keeping you two very, very busy. Uh, I'm sure you have lots of plans for Black Friday. Maybe we can touch on that a little bit later in the discussion. Um, But, uh, Justin, let's uh, let's start with the mobile side of things and uh, have a discussion about what's happening in the mobile ecosystem. Uh, We know it's a tough old market out there at the moment. The South African economy is not in great shape, hasn't been in great shape for a number of years. Consumers are under under pressure. Inflation is rising. Spending power is down. And we also know that consumers are upgrading their phones less frequently than they used to. Um, how, how is this market shaping up and how is it impacting on Samsung? Duncan, thanks. So, you know, we, we think about the headwinds that are affecting us and on a global basis, these macroeconomic factors are, are playing out. And with this postpaid market, you know, the contracts that we're all familiar with or prepaid, the average replacement cycle has extended quite significantly. I suppose in the South African context, we often think of 24 months, mm. right, being, being the term. But 36-month contracts have become very prevalent right now. And on average, globally, we're seeing the replacement cycle extend all the way up to about 47 months, wow. which is quite substantial. And that goes down to the, the quality of the build, the, um, you know, just the capability of the devices that we've got at this point in time. But we believe that 2022 is the peak of that, and we're going to start to see a retraction mm-hmm. um, based on certain innovations that are coming through in the market right now and the like, where that contract term is going to start pulling back towards the 40-month mark and and so forth. So uh, we we are seeing that coming back. Having said that, uh, it's amazing. Um, You you think about the pressure of inflation. You think about what's happened with fuel uh, pricing. We think about what what load shedding's done to the economy. The mobile phone market has been incredibly robust Mm. at this point in time. Um, And there's a couple of factors that are attributing... uh, to, to that effect. You know, when we're seeing this migration uh, of 2G customers to, to 4G, a lot of discussion about operators switching off those mm. networks, uh, government talking about it at this point in time. Uh, that's one aspect of it, but very much in the premium segment even, where you would expect to see some pullback and, and the like. That market's alive and well. And we, we see customers kind of making that conscious decision of saying, well, if I'm going to be investing in this technology, let me stretch it, let me, let me go for mm-hmm. the very best that's available out there. Um, you know, s- having said that, I think there's also n- a number of new platforms, if I can call it that, coming into the market that are allowing customers to do this. And the one that I'd refer to is particularly trade-ins. Mm-hmm. Uh, South Africa hasn't been historically a market where the consumer has adopted that idea of, well, I've gone past my contract term or my, you know, the life cycle of my phone, let me trade in. And we're very much in a hand-me-down market. Yes. You know, I pass my, uh, you know, Mike, here we go, or vice versa, whatever it might be my kids, uh, grandparents, whatever. Um, but suddenly we're realizing, hang on, there's a stored value after this period of time. Mm, mm. And again, it goes back to the quality of the product is still good. The technology platform is there to on-sell. And so uh, that's allowing customers to to buy back up into that premium segment. Mm. So it's, it's interesting what you say about the, the, uh, the, the refresh cycles, and you, yes. you say they're going to start to shrink a little bit going forward. Um, but uh, you almost get the impression that consumers have also become more wary of upgrading, upgrading because uh, they're not get necessarily getting the huge upgrades that you saw, say, five or ten years ago sure. when smartphone development was at an incredible pace. The, the pace of development certainly seems to have slowed quite a bit. And, of course, um, companies like Samsung and others are now offering uh, software updates that go f- well beyond uh, what we saw historically. I think Samsung is now offering four years of Android updates, whereas in the past it was maybe two or three years. Yes. So uh, I think very much um, 
should you need your handset to last longer, it can do that. Mm. And in terms of the, the major shifts in technology, uh, a lot of that has been, you know, those questions come through around, is my camera good enough? Um, yeah. It's more software oriented upgrades that are taking place. Right. Um, optimization of battery and the like. Nonetheless, I think there's products like our Galaxy uh, Z Fold series. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a new form factor. It's bringing a new dynamic into the market. That's certainly prompting uh, the, the upgrade to, to take place and customers are seeing that. But also what we're seeing is that um, if I think about generation three, generation four of the current model, that market is now coming through and upgrading at a quite a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. So there was some pullback. Watch the market. Let me see where the technology is. But as an example, that market would have been perhaps on a camera tech platform that gave them um, 20 megapixels, maybe 48 megapixels. Now suddenly they can jump into 108 megapixels. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the gap is there. The, the shift is available. Plus, there's been this dynamic of work from home that took place. And even though you know, we're starting to return to the office and the like, many companies have now moved their ERP solutions, uh, their sales platforms mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. you know, it, dealing with this. But now suddenly you and I have access to the, the data that we need from our mobile device. And we need the processing power to do that screen capability, the battery life for that. And so I think that's also brought about a... Um, reinvigoration into that uh, into that market. You mentioned foldables. Uh, mm. You're now on your fourth generation of yes. foldable smartphones. Uh, your principal competitor in the smartphone market still doesn't have a folding product sure. in that category. Um, what has the uptake been uh, for your folding phones, both globally and in South Africa? And how big does the folding phone business eventually get? Does it eventually become more important to Samsung than the historical Galaxy S series, for example? Okay, I, th I think we're seeing both platforms have a place right now right. In, in the market. Um, very much dependent on, on form factor preference, mm -hmm. e effectively. But the, the, foldable, the folding capability uh, is, is starting to find a, uh, a loyal following, firstly. Yeah. And what's interesting, particularly in that market, is that, you know, I was just talking about the replacement cycles. Yeah. That market is actually replacing almost annually right now. Wow. Um, so it's, well, a large portion of that market is replacing annually. Um, so they're enjoying it. They're utilizing. Productivity is, is up. So definitely, uh, I think the folding uh, platform in the category uh, will continue to, to gain purchase uh, mm -hmm. in the market. You know, it's been a, it's a journey, right? So it seems quite simple, but... Not all applications from the beginning were optimized to work in a in a screen that's folded. And if I can maybe just use my device here, of you know, course. to go from uh, this outer screen to the inner screen and have a synchronization of the application between the two. These are things that we had to work on with the likes of Instagram, uh, Gmail, uh, mm -hmm. and the like, you know, YouTube and so forth. That's now coming into its own, and developers are now seeing that as, ah, oh, I've got to develop not only for the bar type phone, but for the foldable category mm -hmm. as well. So, yes, definitely uh, we've staked a lot on, on making this uh, a reality. Mm -hmm. We think the time is right for it. Uh, and, and issues of quality and durability, you know, we've proven that this is a, a yeah. viable product, um, that the consumer can utilize it. And so... Um, it certainly will be a mainstay of our launch schedule sure. going forward. Right. And um, it's very much been a premium product, of course, to date. Yes. Uh, I think the entry price is $1,000, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Is a cheaper product in the foldable range? I think $1,000 is the starting price on the so flip. flip. Put it into South African mm -hmm. um, contract terms. Yeah. So we're talking about Black Friday. You could go get this on a 36-month contract from 499 per month right now. Okay. Normal price, 36 months, would be around about uh, 699 mm -hmm. Rand, and on 24 months, 999. Okay. okay, so that's the contract pricing. But yes, you're still talking about it's a, a 20,000 Rand yeah. purchase price yeah. plus. plus. Yes. Does that go down into the sort of mid-range market at some point? Do you see foldable phones becoming a mass market product? It will ultimately move there, mm -hmm. yes, um, as, as we go into, into that category. Um, not this year, uh, sure. uh, certainly. Um, but ultimately, we do see that technology expanding and perhaps expanding categories as well. 
okay. uh, at this point. So um, we, we do see a future where this product becomes a broader portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about the mass market. Um, the premium segment seems to be doing just fine. Yeah. Uh, what's happening at the mass market? Our consu we know consumers are under pressure. We know a lot of that pressure is on lower LSMs. Um, how, how, how are you seeing, let's start with the mid-market and then talk mass market. Mid-market sure. is your A-series devices. Correct. Uh, how are those doing in the market? Uh, what are you seeing out there? So I think the, the consumer wins in every price point right now. Mm -hmm. um, that A-series in that mid-tier, so we've, we have A's right the way through, but in the mid-tier of that, you know, the product today that you get is basically the equivalent of a flagship product three years ago yes. or two years ago almost. Um, it has the OS updates applied, the camera capabilities. In fact, in some cases, battery performance is, is next level mm -hmm. in, in that regard. So uh, very robust market as well. Um, I really can't complain at any particular segment uh, effectively there. In fact, that segment is the fastest growing segment of our business mm -hmm. um, right now. Uh, again, there's a couple of reasons for that. And one of the big introductions that we've made this year is the opportunity to bundle both the A-series product with one of our ecosystem products, so our Galaxy, you know, the watch that we have. Um, and we see the, the customer shift into this broader ecosystem play. So I want the handset, but I want it to integrate with my tab and I want it to integrate with my, my watch. And we've preached that message for, I think, as long as I've known you. Mm. Uh, uh, basically, 2021, 2022 has been the year that that's actually become the reality okay. uh, in there. So right now, if you, on, uh, I suppose I'm giving away a stat, I don't know if I should be, but uh, like about 43 to 45%, depending on the, on the category, of our A-series customers, when they take it out on contract, are taking a watch oh, as well. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Um, which is phenomenal. Mm in that regard. And um, it just shows that we're very conscious about, uh, on the time, I suppose, but it's more about our well-being, monitoring our um, biometric impedance, our heart rates, mm -hmm. checking the steps that I do, the integration with the likes of Strava if I'm cycling or running, you know, these kind of things. So we're seeing the customer really start to look at their devices as being optimized for what you know, their, their day part, what mm. they're using it for, um, and then having it integrated seamlessly in the ecosystem. Mm. Okay. Let's just touch briefly on the entry-level side of the yep. things. Uh, does Samsung still make feature phones? We don't. You're out of That's that market. We're out of that. You know, we, we've got a view. Um, you know, I spoke about a second ago where government's looking to switch off the 2G network yes. uh, from a, a handset and voice and comms perspective. Um, but we've got to bridge this digital divide. We've got to get the larger majority of the market mm -hmm. onto the 4G platform. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just so many, uh, it has such a, a vast benefit in terms of, you know, whether you're talking about a product like Facebook or YouTube, but access to content, access yep. to different services that are applicable uh, on that platform. So um, we're working pretty hard with the mobile operators, with the retail partners that we have out there to, to bring that uh, price point into the market, but also again, you know, give opportunities, whether it be on a Black Friday sales promotion or through other bundling promotions, to introduce uh, a, an affordable 4G handset. Okay. So does Samsung South Africa sell any 2G or 3G only no. devices in this market anymore? No, we, all we've moved out of that completely. Uh, completely. 4G as a, as a standard is entry point. Is the base entry. What is the cheapest phone you can buy cash from Samsung today? Today, our entry price point would be 1799 mm -hmm. um, On Black Friday, it was 1499 uh, Too late we, for that, we, yeah. we're publishing <laughs> after the fact. But, but uh, we're holding that <laughs> price in many of the retailers through uh, yeah. the following week. So, okay. uh, and again, going into the, the festive season and the like, that, that price point will be there. But uh, let's call it the mid-1000 mark. Right. Um, and what's great about it is we've actually introduced a number of new products uh, over the past month. Um, 
in the sort of the, the next one and a half thousand rand band effectively mm. there. So there's quite a bit of variety of choice depending on screen size, battery performance uh, that the customer's looking for. Okay. And your thoughts on government's push to move off 2G and 3G? Do you think it's feasible to do that in the next couple of years? Uh, I imagine there's still a lot of Samsung 2G devices in the market being yep. used. Um, how, how, how much sense does this plan make right now? I think the direction is correct. Uh, um, the the timing of of it is perhaps the question mark. Uh, how feasible it is, uh, you know, the at a, at a pure you know sales perspective, it would be great if it had to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, sell more phones, but um, you know, realistically, I think it's. Um, there's a, there's a very clear benefit to the consumer to be on the 4G platforms, a yep. data-rich platform effectively like that. The mobile operators have worked incredibly hard to bring um, the, the, the tariff price points, the data proposition down. I know we'd always like it to be lower. We, we're always pushing, uh, you know, consumers for, for that there. But um, we really shouldn't be leaving... Uh, customers behind on a platform that is still very reliant up, you know, on technology like USSD string mm-hmm. and um, making standard voice. It's yes. just such a, a richer environment out there. Um, and again, I think back to the opportunities in education, the opportunities for broader um, civil communication and the like. These, you know, 4G platform enables that uh, mm-hmm. quite substantially and uh, we need to make that accessible. Before we go to Mike, uh, yeah. one last question for you on, on, mm. on, on the mobile side. Uh, 5G, you, you yes. have introduced 5G devices across a range of price points now. I think you've got A-series phones that are also Correct. 5G capable. Um, how, how much of the demand are you seeing in the market from consumers specifically for 5G? Is that dr- driving consumer interest? What are you seeing out there? So it's, it's honestly speaking, it's not at this point in it's time. It's not, okay. okay. Um, nonetheless, I think it's a catch-22 situation that we have. It's it's a consideration mm-hmm. uh, in, in the purchase factor, but you know we, we've done some analysis and looked at what are the key drivers of purchase of, of a handset, and 5G capability is fifth ranked. Mm-hmm. Okay, so price point, uh, camera, you know these kind of things come right. through uh, before that. The reason being is what's the proposition right now? Um, speed is one, but 4G um, advanced is it's fine. Uh, it's pretty good mm. uh, in that regard. However, the mobile operators do require, uh, you know, more handsets on that 5G network in order to enable more services and mm. the like. So, it's a catch twenty two, and we've got to populate that that platform. So, really, the direction that we've taken is to try and make sure that the 5G product introduction is at the same price as the LTE product would have been. Mm-hmm. And in most cases, we're able to, to do that so that we're not asking the customer to choose between the 4G device and 5G. Mm. We've brought the 5G to the 4G price point. Um, and largely, that's been, been successful. And mm-hmm. I think we'll then start to see uh, the efforts of the mobile operator that they've been putting in start to bear fruit now mm-hmm. as we go into probably 2023. Good stuff. Mike van Leer, you are the Consumer Electronics Director at Samsung South Africa. And I guess you get to look after everything else uh, outside of mobile. What do they say, Duncan? They say everything that plugs in permanently. Although we have one or two mobile products now, which is quite nice to see the expansion into that. But everything that plugs in permanently, a TV, a fridge, a washing machine... All of these exciting products. Okay. That's what I look after. Great. Well, you and Justin hosted the media to uh, an event at your ex- new experience center in at your head office in Bryanston, Johannesburg, and uh, had a look at some of the latest tech that's coming down the line. And there's lots to talk about uh, outside of mobile. So yeah. let's let's look at some of the stuff that uh, that you have announced or that Samsung is working on, which uh, is really interesting. And let's start with the big category of TVs. Uh, obviously a popular subject uh, this week. In fact, let's talk a little bit about Black Friday since yeah. it is Black Friday week. Um, what, what, do you, uh, what do you typically see on Black Friday versus the rest of the year in terms of TV sales? Firstly, there are a couple of dynamics, I think, <coughs> to Black Friday. <coughs> Certainly the month of November has now become the largest uh, selling month for TV in the year. Uh, I guess 10 years ago, Probably even five years ago, December or festive season was mm-hmm. always the, the biggest uh, time for these types of products. Uh, but November has, uh, has surpassed that by some way. Is that specifically because of Black Friday? Yes, it is. It's specifically because of Black Friday. 
probably about four years ago, some of the retailers decided to make a black week. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll remember that quite clearly. I think 2018 was probably the first time they did a black week. Uh, Justin will remember that uh, quite clearly as well. And then uh, a couple of years later, uh, some of them were doing a black month. Uh, because this, of COVID. Well, this was part of it. Yes, mm-hmm. quite right. I, I think that the, f- the, the, the year before COVID, 2019, there were one or two retailers that, that ventured into black month. Mm-hmm. But COVID was certainly a, a driver in uh, the black month, uh, I guess, less touch, touch points. Not having these huge crowds going yeah. into store was, was a big driver to that. Uh, this year, we've seen a, a little bit of a mix. There's some retailers going black month. There's some retailers going black week or black five day, as some of them call it. Um, and there's even some retailers that have just stuck to one day only. Yes. Um, and some of those retailers will be opening on midnight. Um, uh, so tomorrow night we'll be lucky enough to go to stores uh, for the, the sure first rush. What's sure that's lucky. <laughs> uh, well, I don't think it's lucky, but uh, of course I'll be there with some of the retail partners yeah. and it'll be an exciting time for us. Right. We hope that uh, the customers will pick up uh, yeah. a lot of TVs over this time. But, of course, lots of other products. We do our full, full range of products yeah. on Black Friday. It's but TV particularly... Yeah is something that people look out for every November. Is this an opportunity for, for you to get rid of um, older stock? Uh, what is Black Friday about? For no, something? not at all. It, it, um, uh, g- general life cycle of TV is one year mm-hmm. it, it, uh, uh, for most of the brands at any rate. Uh, normally launched uh, towards the beginning of the year, and I hope we'll speak about some of those new technologies that are coming into, uh, next year, mm-hmm. uh, particularly for us. Um, and um, uh, it really revolves uh, around two things. Uh, number one is that, as I understand it, Black Friday was when retailers got into the black. Okay. So they started making a profit by November, by is Thanksgiving. That's where the name comes from. That's okay. where it comes from. Okay. And so any additional sales that they could do for the rest of the year was kind of cherry on the top for mm-hmm. them. And it was around this time that that happened. I'm not sure if that's like that today. But that's where it originated from around Thanksgiving and uh, came to our shores a few years ago, as you, as you well know. Uh, the second is that, particularly in TV, there's efficiencies around panel production. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, uh, certainly creating volume in panel uh, for a yearly commit is something quite um, um, beneficial to pricing. So if you can drive volume, you, you tend to get a, a, a better price. Mm. And all of the panel producers do that. And mm-hmm. that's really where it comes from. And I guess that's why you get a really big saving on TV mm-hmm. around this time. Right. Right, let's talk about what's coming uh, in TV specifically. Uh, we, we have a very tech-savvy audience, uh, and our audience wants to know about the latest and greatest uh, in home studio and, and all the rest of it. Uh, sure. Take us through some of the big announcements that are coming. You're, you're introducing mini LED TVs. Well, yes, uh, we call that, uh, um, uh, quite right, micro LED. Is micro the, LED. I mean. Micro LED, yeah. which is really exciting. Um, in fact, um, this will probably be the most exciting year for Samsung, uh, particularly here in South Africa. Um, I'll start actually with the OLED technology. Oh, yes. Um, there are multiple technologies in TV, but in the premium space, there's, there's really two technologies that are, are, are premium. Mm-hmm. The one is QLED, and we've been backing QLED for some time. In fact, I was asked at the beginning of the year by retail, uh, by another media um, a journalist, uh, when we're we going to bring OLED to the shores, because mm-hmm. we had already launched it globally. Uh, we've been doing very well with uh, QLED. Eight out of ten premium customers are choosing Samsung QLED over the, the technology of OLED. Before you continue, what is the difference? I've always wanted to ask someone from Samsung this because I don't know the answer. I've seen the terms QLED in the market. I've seen the term QNED with an N in the market. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen the term OLED. What are the differences between these, these terms? So, so in essence, uh, um, uh, OLED is an organic technology. It means that, in a way, it degrades over time. Uh, the, the, the real benefit to OLED um, is that the colors are extremely accurate versus what your eye can see. You get a pure black. And you get a very, very dark and pure black through that. The, 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 the slight negative to OLED mm-hmm. is that it is a slightly dimmer panel. Okay. It's not as bright as QLED. Um, and it degrades over time. So you can get burn, burn in on your TV over a period of mm-hmm. time. QLED, on the other hand, is a lot brighter and it lasts a lot longer because it's not organic. It's, mm-hmm. it's manufactured uh, as, uh, as that technology goes. It's LED backlit. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And, um, um, but it happens to be extremely bright. And in most cases at home, at any rate, your living room will have some window or maybe even sliding doors on the side letting in a reasonable amount of light. For instance, if I had to make that uh, choice, I would probably buy a Q 
LED mm-hmm. TV because it's brighter um, and it would last long. So if you want to watch TV in the daytime, QLED is probably better than OLED. Exactly, exactly. But if you're a real connoisseur and you're looking at those colors and you want those richer blacks and maybe you've got a dimmer, maybe a cinema type space, mm. then OLED is, is certainly a technology that we, we can appreciate. And, and that's why we made the decision to now bring that uh, technology to the shores of South Africa. And we'll be launching that in Q1 next year. So we're incredibly excited about that. We took a whole lot of retail partners, in fact, to, uh, to Korea. And in fact, we met some as well in IFA in Berlin. Uh, in September, and they're completely blown away by the technology that they bring in. So they, they're bugging me. They say, so when's it arriving? When's it arriving? What sizes are you bringing? We'll go period? from 55 to 77 inch. Mm-hmm. It's uh, typically the sizes that you bring in uh, with OLED. Uh, that's another point on, Q, on QLED is that it scales much bigger. Okay. So we go all the way up to 98 inch. Uh, we've, uh, we're very proud to bring in 4K and 8K and 98 inch. Um, but the 4K uh, version of 98 inch is doing particularly well in South Africa. And in fact, this will be our biggest month yet. 98 inch TV. The sales That's of 98 inch. It's astonishingly large. <laughs> it's, it's huge. Yeah. You actually need a reasonably large room for that. Yeah. Um, but when you see it, it's completely incredible. And it comes with all of the tech that you need. And if are people you, putting 98 inch TVs in their living rooms or are these in specialized theaters? No, 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 no. They're putting them in their living in rooms. In their living rooms. Uh, when, you t- when you speak specialized theater, uh, generally they'll, they'll stick to OLED or they'll go projection with the screen. Oh. Um, but the other exciting technology that we're bringing in is micro LED. This is very specific to this type of space. Uh, we will launch from 88 inch to 126 inch in South Africa. Uh, it's varying from around 1.5 million rand to 3 million rand. I'll this take is, three. Yeah, this is this <laughs> customer that you're talking to. Take so the order now. <laughs> individual, individually placed uh, LEDs, the accuracy of this panel is outstanding. It's literally like you're living within the image of the TV. And you said it goes up to what size? 126 inch. Right, that is absolutely yeah, nice. That's a cinema screen in your house. In fact, you can actually scale this product. And in our professional display uh, area, we have a product called the wall. Yes. This wall can uh, scale up to any size you want, but typically people use around 146 inch. So it's made of separate panels. So oh. literally you can scale it. But in our micro LED TV section, it comes fully boxed, fully ready to mount as, as would any other TV, right. which is extremely exciting. So, so and, business um, might, I mean, you might see this used in Times Square in New York, for example. Yes, that, we, that is also the exact same technology. It's mm. just uh, simply the size of the pixel pitch. Okay. So when you look at those large screens, which, by the way, we also do. Samsung also yes. manufactures products like That's that. That's a different uh, tech. It's not the it, this. It, well, it's mm. kind of the same tech, but the but the size of the the LED the the uh, makes it micro. Yes. And so when you're looking at it reasonably close, it's it's completely clear. Mm. Uh, but when you're looking at it, for instance, in Times Square, those those LEDs are actually quite large. It mm. just looks clear because you're far, far away, away from, from it the, yeah. from the image. But right. it's built on really the same technology. Right. So when are these um, micro LED TVs going on sale? So micro LED, we are going to be launching in a very specialized channel. Uh, we're under negotiation and some NDA with some partners, okay. uh, but it's, it's really bespoke cinema space. Um, and we hope to be launching uh, those in Q1 next year. Okay, okay. So you'll, you'll work with a partner who will then help you help customers with installation, which is, I imagine correct, is correct. not a trivial thing. It's not a trivial size. thing. And yeah. of course, it includes a lot of other aspects to a cinema build. It's not yeah. just the panel. Mm. Uh, of course, sound and uh, soundproofing of a room, um, even cooling of the room, this type of thing is very important to that customer. And they don't have a lot of time to mess around. So they need consultants to come in. Yeah. And that's why we will launch it in a very specialized channel. It won't be available mm. in the run-of-the-mill retail how big is the market in South Africa for a TV that costs between one and a half and three million rand? We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Your best estimate? <laughs> oh, I don't think, uh, we, we're talking about ultra high net worth individuals. Yeah. Um, probably the number of 1,500 uh, people of this kind of uh, okay. stature come to mind in South Africa. Um, you know, the, the big estates that are going up with mm. 20, 30, 40, 50, you keep going million rand houses. Mm. This is the type of customer that we would, uh, we would approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, th- I don't think you'll sell more than around five or 10 of these per year. Right, right. That's kind of the size of the market, yeah, I would yeah. say. And that'd be good business. <laughs> I guess it's good business, but it also, you know, it, yeah. it just shows the technology, but it also maybe gives you a glimpse of what, what's to come. Yes. Because I think that that technology over time will, will, will continue to commoditize as it scales. Yes. 
Uh, so I guess a bit uh, like my colleague with foldable mm. phones, you know, in time, not next year, maybe mm. not the ne- year after, mm. but in time, you'll start seeing some of these technologies coming into mainstream television. Now, uh, 4K versus 8K. I mm. presume 4K is now a mainstream technology. Yep. Uh, you're not selling 1080p sets in much anymore, I imagine. Oh, there's a little bit of full HD yeah. out there. I, I guess it's a bit like the feature phone of TV. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a much smaller part of the market now, but there's some demand for, for entry-level sets, uh, which we still play in. Mm-hmm. Uh, 32 inch, 40 inch, this is about where we, we, we cap out uh, yeah. on those TVs. Uh, but UHD is uh, by far the biggest part mm-hmm. of the market. Um, at least 50% of the market is just standard UHD, which is a 4K set. Yeah. And then you start moving into the QLED space uh, with uh, also with uh, um, uh, with QLED. And then you move up into technology like gaming TVs. Yes. This is something very interesting for us because gaming is becoming bigger and bigger. It's by far the, the, the biggest uh, uh, growing sector in the world and in South Africa, of course, is uh, the same way. So whether you're a PC gamer with a monitor, and I guess we'll speak about that as well, uh, or you're a, a console gamer uh, looking for 120 hertz, you move into these types of TVs, uh, which are all 4K content mm. TVs. If you are pushing in 1080p content, which many of the providers still are doing, uh, it will upscale to 4K. Yes, uh, which is interesting, and and in fact, uh, I've just bought myself a new uh, 4K TV. It happens to be the Frame TV, mm-hmm. a lifestyle TV, which I I quite liked personally. Um, you can see very little difference between 4K content and 1080p being upscaled. Mm. I can't personally see it in my in my living room, right. for instance. So it's very interesting technology, and and I guess that comes into the processing power of the TV to upscale that content mm. into 4K. Which They're becoming is, com- quite powerful. Which is becoming extremely powerful. And, and by the way, the same with 8K. So 8K content is starting to, to come out. You've seen the Lord of the Rings coming now in 8K. It's, it's absolutely magnificent to see this content. What format do you get that on? You get that in... The um, Blu-ray, 8K. No, 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 no. You can stream 8K or download 8K. It's a huge file, yes. uh, I, I assure you. But... Um, you can do, I know you can do 8K and on Amazon, YouTube. Amazon yes, is bringing yeah. it in um, yeah. uh, in 8K. And yes, there's an 8K channel on YouTube as well. Yeah. So there is some content coming in. And as the internet speeds get more, so the content will become uh, more available. Yeah. But what's also important is that if you stream in 4K, we upscale it to the 8K as well. So mm. the, the screen is absolutely magnificent when you see it. Yeah. You know, 65 inch and above is really where you start to see that blossom. For sure, for sure. And of course, MultiChoice is broadcasting the World Cup in... In 4K, it's the first 4K. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's where I saw the difference between 1080p upscaled yeah. and the 4K. I can't see the difference okay. with the Samsung TV upscaling it to the 4K oh, interesting. content. I couldn't see the difference yeah. watching the first World Cup game, mm. which was uh, interesting to see. And interesting what you say about gaming and uh, I know the new Xbox and I presume the new PlayStation as well yeah. uh, support things like high refresh rates, like yeah. 120 hertz, exactly. high dynamic range yeah. and, and similar technologies. Yeah. You're seeing demand specifically from customers who want to play Xbox, I presume, and possibly even use these yes. TVs as monitors for gaming on PCs, yes. uh, demanding these sort of technologies like high yeah. refresh rate, yeah. etc. Firstly, the, 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 the segment, gaming segment in the premium segment is the largest growing segment. Mm-hmm. We've seen growth uh, even as small as 43-inch. Yes. Uh, 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 43 inch actually is an ideal uh, size for a gamer, ex- especially um, uh, a high-end gamer yes. because they don't want to look left and right. It loses, <laughs> loses some time mm-hmm. to be able to look. So 43-inch uh, that we introduced, in fact, this year, called the 43 QN90 with 120 uh, uh, hertz refresh rate, has been a, a crazy success. We keep running out of this uh, inventory um, and we bring in more and more and more. But whether it's 43, 50, 55, 65, in fact, the 98 inch that I spoke about yeah. is also a QN90 range, 120 hertz refresh rate, uh, absolutely uh, dedicated for that console gaming. Right. By the way, we don't see that many people using TV for PC gaming. You don't? No. Um, and, and it's because of size. Uh, generally speaking, you're sitting at a desk and that TV is actually too large mm. uh, for what you need. So we've seen uh, sizes of 27-inch, 32-inch, uh, around about the optimal size for a monitor. Yes, we do 49-inch, which is in fact two 27 inches mm-hmm. together, which is important because then you have the split screen. 
And I'm sure you're going to ask me about it, but the Odyssey Arc... I was about to say you do a 65-inch one. Too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in fact a 55-inch, and oh, that 55. splits okay. into three 27-inch yes. uh, screens. So you can split your YouTube channel, your, your chat box, and, yes. and of course your game into three, and it kind of curves yes, you over were, you. You were very kind to send it uh, through to us, and we had it in our studio here. Until Which means you can probably tell me more about it than I can. <laughs> but, um, but, a, but a wonderful product, um, and, uh, and we've seen huge demand for that. You'll, you'll know that gamers are spending an ex- exorbitant amount of money on their on their tech, yeah. uh, and they're demanding panels that can give them that sort of uh, re- refresh rate, 144 hertz, 165 hertz, 240 hertz. That's been demanded depending on the graphics card and the mm. capability of the machine, and I don't think it ever ends for the upgrade, the, mm. not these machines. But these monitors now can match the performance of the machine, uh, and this Odyssey Arc was something that... Uh, has been accepted, um, I, I don't even know how to say it. Well, l- let me put it this way. We were at IFA in September in Berlin. There were two of these on display, and you had to queue up to be able to uh, <laughs> engage with the product. And uh, I can tell you that we had flips and folds. They built walls out of flips and folds that were opening and closing, you know, <laughs> which was really impressive. But what was more impressive was the Odyssey Arc. Oh, <laughs> Somehow sure. they were queuing to see this. <laughs> And yes. we were, uh, I mean, in fact, I myself queued yeah. to see it and then sat down the gaming chair and it curves over you. Yes. It's absolutely amazing, yeah, as, 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 a, you, as you've seen. As, as a big fan of Microsoft Flight Simulator, it's, I, I can say it's very, very immersive. <laughs> but I can see it also appealing uh, not only to the gaming market, but also potentially to, to stockbrokers. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Someone yes. could have their Bloomberg terminal. So they have their financial information at the top of the screen. Exactly. Uh, they could be have a search engine and their whatever else they do, the Excel spreadsheets while they're crunching company numbers in the bottom part exactly. of the screen. It would, exactly. would appeal to that market as well. Exactly. But it is a massive, massive screen, but definitely quite niche, I'd imagine. I look forward to seeing the router. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what else are you guys announcing? You've you've got new projection technology coming in audio visual. Yeah, I mean, we've got, uh, well, we've got tons of things to speak about, but uh, audio visuals specifically, we, um, we launched LSP9, a short throw projector, uh, which goes up to 120 hertz. That was about two years ago. Uh, but we bought in its younger brother called the Freestyle. I'm not sure if you've seen the product, but it's uh, no. sort of uh, just a bit larger than a can of beans uh, that you can carry around. It's uh, 700 grams. Um, it projects up to 100 inches. I did see this. Uh, we, you you yeah. showed it to me at yes. Mustek. Uh, Mustek yeah, has got there a we go. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So it's got multiple uses, but yes. it's, uh, I don't like me calling it this, but it's it's like a portable TV because it's got all of the Tizen uh, um, uh, content and apps built into it, just the same as any Samsung TV. Right. So all of your streaming services are already built in and you can set it up and go at 100 inches. You can put it on the roof, you can put it on any wall, it auto-focuses, auto-corrects. It's an absolutely amazing product. Uh, what's even better about it is that you can get an external battery pack that lasts up to four hours. So if there's some load shedding, um, <laughs> this type of thing, you can still connect uh, to your freestyle projector. Or you can take it camping or you can give it to the kids when you go into a hotel room or yeah. you know, uh, a home at the coast or whatever the case is and uh, they can set up and watch any kind of content whatsoever. It screen shares to any d- device in the, whether it be mobile or TV. And of course, you can share any content with the device as well through Bluetooth and Wi Fi or NFC, whatever you like. Right. Before we leave the audiovisual stuff, I, I have to ask you a question. Actually, my, my, uh, our studio editor and I were discussing this uh, this morning. About 10 or 15 years ago, 3D TV was the thing. Um, you know, you could, television manufacturers couldn't sell a TV if it didn't have 3D in it. And then it disappeared. And now I don't think these t- modern TVs even support 3D anymore. What happened? Well, that was a long time ago. It was uh, before I even took over TV at Samsung. Um, I guess the technology was, um, uh, was fleeting. Uh, I guess there was some parts of it that uh, were, were wanted. And you needed some sort of a device or, or, or some pair of glasses to be able to sort of, you did, uh, yeah. uh, if you remember correctly, mm. Uh, but I also think that the quality of the TVs just uh, began to get so good that you, really it was very immersive at any rate. Mm. And if you see uh, some of the TVs that we've launched now, I mean, the immersiveness of it. Uh, and I know not everyone has one and a half or three million rand to spend on a TV. But when I saw that TV, some of the customers actually joked, this is like a 3D TV. 
because it seems to have depth. Right. So I think the technology of TVs, you know, uh, basically moved on. M- uh, moved on and made it redundant. And yeah. The immersiveness of the quality of the TV was just uh, good enough. Mm. If I add to that, I mean, yeah. you often find the base of these technologies or these ideas coming back Quite right. in other other ways. And you know, one of the things that we see, and not even Samsung, but uh, the research is showing that there's going to be a resurgence in VR technology coming through, um, starting effectively from next year and ramping up. And you, you you often find this thing that there's a lot of hype created. Um, within the space around an idea. And uh, I think Gartner, uh, a research company, puts it nicely as you get the hype and you get this valley of despondency where mm. everybody thinks, oh, it's over. And then slowly out comes this curve of where the technology gets purchased and the like. And you will start to see things like VR technology, 3D immersion, that coming in, perhaps not in the original form envisaged yeah. uh, of a TV. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, but again, I do. I think the point is right: is that yeah. these days the immersiveness of the panels yeah. also exist. Yeah. But three D, I think, it went through that Gartner hype curve, went down into the valley, valley of despondency, and never emerged. And never emerged. <laughs> uh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> True. Eight K okay. is this the future of TV, or uh, I mean, are people's eyesight good enough to tell the difference between eight K and four K? <laughs> Mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but with a little bit of help with my glasses. Um, yeah, I think that that will become a uh, it will become the natural progression mm. uh, into the next uh, realm. Uh, I think 8K will become a, a stock standard. So just like you said, 4K has mm. become the norm. I think 8K in time will become the norm. Oh, I don't think end that, of that decade? will. Well, yes, I think mm. so. I think so. Mm. Uh, it's got a lot to do with uh, with connectivity and speed. Right. Uh, the the file sizes are large, mm-hmm. uh, so even some of the, the the biggest markets in the world would uh, you know it would be difficult to stream or download a you know full length uh, feature film. Yeah, um, but certainly I think that that will become the stock standard yeah. without any doubt. As and internet, I guess, as internet infrastructure gets better and better, and we exactly have gigabit connections at home. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Oh, we're almost there, right? Yeah, we're almost yeah, there. Almost there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I think I'm on a 500 meg line, so <laughs> close. It, it, it needs to get there, and yeah. uh, then it will become uh, a stock standard. Yeah, yeah. Before we wrap, um, you uh, don't only do audiovisual stuff, of course, you also do fridges and other appliances. Sure. Um, not really the focus of Tech Central, but out of interest, what is some of the stuff? What's some, what's some of the stuff happening in refrigeration and dishwashing and all the rest? Of it? This is something you should really look at. Yeah. Um, when we went to IFA um, in September. There were two things that, uh, that I noticed, two major themes on the Samsung stand. The first was smart things. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know smart things. We've known it for some time. Uh, but there's, uh, there's, there's, there's a, a renewed energy behind smart things. This is your things. IoT platform. Correct. Mm. What's interesting about the platform, number one, it's open. We, we, we've co-developed uh, applications and products with over 400 vendors now, which is important. So... Things like, and I can even say this, can you believe it, Philips globes that you can connect to, change the, uh, obviously turn it on and off, yeah. but change the hue and change the color, this type of thing, uh, was prevalent even on our stand. But what was very interesting is that they had connected smart things to a PV system, mm-hmm. which in the middle of Europe I fo- found a little bit strange. It's quite easy to see a lot of solar systems in South Africa, uh, but I found it to be a little bit strange. And an element of smart things is smart things energy. Right, which is a uh, which looks at your energy consumption in the house, which is not only a sustainable thing, but also a cost. And as you know, energy prices are rising globally; they're rising here. And so, if you can uh, look on one application what energy you're using within your home, and you can save money, and you can save energy, which means saving the planet, uh, it's a good thing. And 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 they show they walked us through a home connected to a plethora of devices including home appliance. Mm-hmm. So in fact, uh, I think this ecosystem is starting to expand now. So looking at the, the energy usage of your air conditioner, for instance, uh, you know, if, if an air conditioner has a digital inverter like our digital inverters have, it saves up to 77% uh, uh, input. But if you're running a PV system, rather cool the home down when the sun is up and then keep the ambient uh, temperature and save the energy there. It's the same with using dishwashers or tumble dryers or washing machines. These typically use a lot of energy. Yes, we have technologies of digital inverter, which save you a lot of power, but the time of the day that you use it can also change the way you use consumption. And Smart Things is guiding that. 
not only of your smartphone, which of course is a normal place that you would have this, but you can also use your TV as the hub to see where your energy is being used uh, in, in, the, in, in the business. And so the importance of, uh, of appliance for us is critical to the complete ecosystem. So you'll see connected fridges, connected washing machines, connected dishwashers. It's not about just saying when you need to order more food or mm. how you order food or um, those types of things. It's also about mapping out that energy usage, which I thought was an incredibly mm. important uh, uh, topic that they brought up, uh, that Samsung brought up yes. in EFA this year. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a, a full range of bespoke uh, product. Um, you'll know bespoke um, probably from the showroom, but it is a multicolored device, so you can change the panels as you wish. Uh, but what's also important is that you can scale it. So when you first, uh, you know, you get your first job and you want a sort of a bottom mount freezer, you don't need too much fr uh, fridge space, you can buy a bespoke and put it in your home. When you decide now that you're married and you have another uh, companion at home, then you can put another one-door fridge. Um, and if you have kids, then like me, I've got two uh, teenagers. Mm -hmm. You need then a four-door fridge that you can <laughs> add to it. So it's scaled uh, like this. And if you don't like the color after a year, then you can change the color, this type of thing. And fully connected, of course, so right. with all the bells and whistles and digital inverter technology. Uh, so that's a very interesting space for us. We'll be expanding that range. So bespoke will also be available in washing machine, dishwasher, dryer, microwave oven. So multicolors, you can... You can buy the colors of the kitchen and uh, fits into your lifestyle in your home, which uh, uh, can make a happy wife, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all interconnected and, and connected to the internet. I mean, there was exactly. a lot of talk a year, years ago about your fridge replenishing the groceries in it mm. by itself automatically. Or sure. we, has that ever really happened? <laughs> It does, funnily enough. Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, a fridge uh, in um, that we've developed in Korea, of course, and Western Europe and in the States mm -hmm. called Family Hub. Uh, which is also a bespoke product. You can also change that color, but it right. has a built-in, uh, uh, the new one has a built-in 32-inch uh, touch device, mm -hmm. uh, which you can do all of these things, including uh, connecting to your online shopping. And uh, I suppose when you're at work and you think you can have a look what's in your fridge and say, oh, I need this, I need this, I need this, you can connect to it and then just tell it to order whatever you want. And um, some retailers, uh, I believe, uh, send it to you within 60 minutes. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of exciting things happening. Uh, guys, thanks so much for taking the time to, to, to join us in the studio. Uh, Justin Hume is, is uh, Vice President for Mobile at Samsung South Africa. And Mike Van Leer is Consumer Electronics Director at Samsung South Africa. Thank you so much for, the, for your thank time you. and thank you for talking to Tech Central today. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.